tonight I make my unusual request that you close your Bibles. It's a custom here that on occasion, when we can, to have as a sermon the reading of a book of the Bible. We are beginning a series for Sunday night in the book of Titus. And the letter that I will be reading today was sent to someone who served under the Apostle Paul, whose name was Titus. And he was ministering in, on the island of Crete. Well, what about Crete? Crete is an island on the southeast of Greece, a long imaginary boundary between the Aegean Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. The island's about 150 miles long from east to west, and its width ranges from 35 at its widest point to seven and a half miles at its narrowest point. It's one of those places we are often familiar with by name, but then if I were to give you a blank map and say, find Crete, a lot of us would be lost. Crete is extremely mountainous, with mountain ranges as high as 8,000 feet that are covering the length of the island. And since the mountains drop down steeply to the southern shores of Crete, there are fewer cities along the southern coast, such as Gortinia, Fair Havens, Lycia, and Phoenix, which was mentioned in Acts chapter 27, verses 8 and 12. Crete's northern coast was much more heavily populated because the mountains sloped down to the shoreline much more gradually. And in the modern day, the four-lane highway that exists on Crete runs along its northern coast. The Old Testament refers to Crete as Kaftor. It was the original home of the Philistines who migrated to the land of Canaan sometime before the Israelites began to enter the land. That's interesting, isn't it? The Philistines came from Crete. The Romans began to dominate the Mediterranean world in the second century BC. It wouldn't be long before Crete would also be brought under Roman domination. In 67 BC, Rome occupied Crete and made it a part of the Roman province that included Cyrene in North Africa, which is in modern Libya. The Roman governor, who had the title proconsul, ruled the province from the Roman capital of Gortiana on the southern coast of Crete. Thus, in the time of Titus, Crete was a Roman province and ruled by a Roman governor. The only writing in the New Testament that mentions Crete is in the book of Acts. Cretans were present among the people in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2.11. And in Acts 2.27, we find the story of Paul's eventful journey to Rome as a prisoner. After sailing along the south of Crete with some difficulty, the ship was caught in a violent storm and shipwrecked on the island of Malta, which is just to the west of Crete. However, all 276 persons who were on board that ship managed to escape harm. Now, while we do not know for certain when Paul and Titus were in Crete, we do know that they were both there. Paul had to return to the mainland. But the ministry there was incomplete. And so with upwards of 20 substantial cities and towns on the island, Titus was left to finish the work. Now, it's been our custom here at the chapel at sometimes to take a sermon time and to read the text of a book of the Bible. I've done so for a book, most often when we are getting ready to preach it. I'm sometimes asked, well, why do we do that? It's almost as though, why do you waste a sermon on just reading the Bible? As soon as I say it that way, hopefully you're a little ashamed. 
I thought tonight, before we do our reading, to give you some reasons that I do so. First, and I'm reminded of this in my own heart often, 1 Timothy 4, 11 through 13, as a biblical example. Paul writing to his other son in the faith, who, who served under him and often served at his behest. Paul wrote this, Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth. But set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, and to teaching. The NLT, New Living Translation, puts it this way, Be an example to all the believers in what you say, in the way you live, in how you love, and in your faith and purity. Till I get there, focus on reading the scriptures to the church, encouraging the believers, and teaching them in it. Now, we don't want to take what Paul said to Timothy in some way as creating an imperative for us as though this is written in that way. Because there's a historical reason for this. It was rare in Bible days for a person to have a copy of even one book of the Old Testament, certainly much less the whole Bible. The whole Bible in the Old Testament days, in the New Testament days, would have been carried around on a cart. You know, all these scrolls. It was the Levites and the scribes, and yes, the king, who were to ensure that the scriptures were maintained, were properly and accurately copied, and were made available to those who were charged to read it. During the exile in Babylon, the Jewish people expanded the synagogues, over time and into the New Testament time, most synagogues had the Pentateuch, that is, the first five books of the Old Testament, the Psalms, the Proverbs, and one or two prophetic books. The synagogues shared with each other the other books of the Old Testament. So these that most of the synagogues had were the most copied ones. A part of any gathering at a synagogue on the Sabbath was a reading of a major section of Scripture. This allowed the people to hear the word. And often they took dictation and transcribed what they heard. Early in Jesus' ministry and in Paul's ministry, they would go to the synagogues to teach. Paul, in particular, had scribal credentials from the Pharisees, rabbinical, I'm sorry, rabbinical credentials from the Pharisees, and so, as a guest rabbi, was often asked to speak, usually not more than once. It also seems that he had personal copies of the scriptures, for he often quoted from the Greek translation of the Old Testament, just called the Septuagint. The invention of the printing press in 1440 changed all of this. Up till that time, books were copied by hand by monks, by scribes, or professional copyists. Most of this copying was of the scriptures. Catholic Church went to great lengths to ensure the accurate copying of the Latin translation of the Bible, which is called the Vulgate. A few important books were copied. However, the ordinary person just didn't have a copy of the scriptures as we have in our day. The first term German translation of the Bible by Luther was published in 1534. The first French translation of the Bible was published by Jacques Lefer de Paul in 1530 in Antwerp, Belgium, and was revised in 1535 by Pierre Robert Olivitan. The first Spanish translation of the Bible by Cassiandro de Reina was published in Switzerland in 1569. And the first English translation of the Bible by Tyndale 
was published in 1535 by Coverdale. What do you notice? From the time of Christ until the 1500s, the Bible only existed in Greek, in Hebrew, and in Latin. How many of the ordinary people of the medieval era were even literate, much less literate, in Latin or Greek or Hebrew? So until the 1500s, the public reading of the scriptures was an important part of the gathering of believers. The Catholic religion during the Middle Ages, when the Bible was read, it was read in Latin. Very few of the common people spoke or read Latin. This common Catholic attending, the common Catholic attending a religious meeting may have heard the Bible read, but would have understood very little if any of it. Unfortunately, we have few written records of the meetings of God's people before the 1500s. All over Europe, believers met to sing and to pray and to hear the Bible taught. These people were not part of the Catholic religion. The records and books and sermons and letters of that period have largely been destroyed. What we do know is that the pastor's elders teaching the Bible were doing so from the Latin or doing so from the original languages. They did not have the Bible in their own tongue. They were reading large sections of the Bible so that those who could read and write were able to copy down what they heard. As the Bible was translated into the spoken language and was being published, more and more families were able to own a Bible, or at least a portion of the Bible. The advance of the gospel into new people's groups has always, without exception, brought literacy with it. We are a people of the book. Missions has emphasized the importance of reducing spoken languages to writing. So that the people could, within the second generation of becoming Christians, have the Bible in their own language. Now that's the history and is the reason that Paul said, give close attention to the public reading of the Bible. This meant that those who read the Bible publicly had to learn to do so with a sense of drama and rhetoric. Not read it with a flat intonation or monotone. To hold the people's attention to express the truths. Now what we see in therefore in the Bible was driven by cultural necessity. It doesn't make it a moral imperative for us. However, when possible, it is beneficial for us then, as a church, to hear the Bible read to us. What are some of the reasons for this? First, sometimes we just need to hear the Bible in the midst of all the noise and clamor and the confusion of our day. Secondly, it highlights the centrality and the importance of the Word. It is the Word of God that primarily will shape and will transform your life. Thirdly, we hear the whole book or a major section of it all at once. This lets us hear the repeated words, the surprising structure, the flow of logic and rhetoric. Many of you have said, hearing a whole book in a setting, they saw things they would have never seen any other way. When I'm preparing for sermons, as much as I can, I try to read through the whole book in a sitting several times before I begin preparation does make preaching on Ezekiel, Isaiah, and other books like that. You have to dedicate some serious time. And we hear it read in a way that we usually do not read it to ourselves. Too many people read the Bible to themselves in a monotone voice in their heads. Unfortunately, too many pastors read the Bible in a monotone or in a rush. As though it's something to get done and get out of the way instead of something to relish. 
My Romanian friends really struggle with this. Reading the Bible very, very fast and at a monotone, and it's just so, it almost feels like this is a waste of time. No, this is probably the most important thing that we will do. Now, to capture the sort of feel of the moment, of what it would have been like to have sat in a gathering of God's people before 1440, or for us in English, before the mid-1500s, I've just asked you to close your Bibles, and I'd like for you to just listen. Brothers and sisters, hear the word of God by Paul to Titus. Paul, a servant of God, and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness in the hope of life eternal, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior, to Titus. To Titus, my true child, in the common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ, our Savior. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I had directed you. If anyone is above reproach. The husband of one wife, his children are faithful and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or a violent or greedy for gain, but rather hospitable A lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine, and also to rebuke those who contradict it. For there are many insubordinate, empty talkers, deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Quote, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy, gluttons, end quote. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. But as for you, Teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderous nor slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good and to train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, and working at home, to be kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, 
Urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Try to, i add this, show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. In your teaching, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned so that an opponent may be put to shame having nothing evil to say about us. Bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing and not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself to redeem us, from all lawlessness, and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Declare these things, exhort, and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Remind them to be submissive to rulers, and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But, oh, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not, oh, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So that, being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people, but avoid Avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful he is self-condemned. When I send Artemis, Articacus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Do your best to speed Zenos, the lawyer, and Apollos on their way, see that they lack nothing, and let our people learn to devote themselves to good works so as to help cases of urgent need and not 
to be unfruitful. All who are with me send greetings to you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. And may grace be with us all. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the spirit who inspired it. For Paul, the apostle who wrote it. For Titus, who received it. And who preached it and transmitted it and exhorted from it and rebuked from it and loved his people through it and set in order the things that remained that the churches in Crete might be sound in faith and in good works. May we also continue to make progress in understanding the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, And may we dedicate ourselves to good works for the sake of your glory and for the good of your people. All God's people said,